1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where we are today, and I, I am not intending to get through the whole chapter. There is a transition uh, toward the end of this chapter to uh, kind of an end times, uh, a sleep awake, pre-trib, post-trib discussion <laughs> that I want to wait to uh, for next week because it's a, it's a bit of a transition. I don't want to jump into that and not have enough time to finish that section. And so uh, in, in chapter 4, we're going to begin chapter 4 and, and get through quite a few of the verses, hopefully through at least the first 12 verses. But as it transitions those last few verses, I want us to spend time uh, talking about that because I know sometimes we talk about those who have fallen asleep and, and, and when Christ returns. There's some, sometimes we have questions about those passages, and so I want us to spend a little more time on, on those. Um, and not going to give you all the answers, uh, because there are different answers <laughs> to some of those questions. But uh, we'll go through uh, some, of, some of the opinions of, of, of theologians, and I'll give those to you. And uh, may not be uh, all the answers, but I'll definitely be... I think most of the answers to questions you may have had. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, as we begin this chapter together, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you were doing, that you do so more and more. Um, it, it's funny. He says, finally, but is this the end of the letter? No. He would make a good Baptist pastor, I think. You know how sometimes we like to say, in conclusion, <laughs> and then the conclusion lasts for a while, or uh, so this is kind of what he's doing. He's saying finally, but this is not the end, uh, and I don't think he really meant it as, as that absolute closing of his letter, as more of kind of a, a as for the rest, it's kind of a transition word that he's transitioning toward his concluding thoughts. We'll say that. He's not saying finally and this is the last sentence because there are a couple more chapters. There's this chapter and also another chapter. But uh, it's, you, you've heard this before when we say finally or in conclusion and it doesn't quite, it still takes a while. This is kind of what Paul's doing here. But he's transitioning here at the closing of this letter to give some very practical instruction uh, as, as to how God wants us to live. So these last few chapters, I think, will be very practical uh, for us as we strive to honor God in the way that we live. There's going to be some instruction for us. Um, and he says, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. And I love this encouragement because many of you in here have been Christians for years, and you, you have sought to walk in a way that pleases God, as you've been doing. But do we honor God the best we can? Can we still grow in the way that we live? Can we grow to be more Christ-like in the way that we live? Yes. You, you have been walking with God for years now, some of you quite a few decades, and you have honored God, you have pleased God, but there's still areas that you and I can grow, regardless of how long you've been a Christian. Sometimes we think we've got it all figured out, and we're kind of beyond certain temptations or beyond certain uh, things in life, but we are not. We're to continue to grow more and more, grow more and more to be more Christ-like, grow more and more in our knowledge of Scripture, uh, to grow in all those areas of life. Uh, sometimes we think, well, I've read through the Bible. I don't need to do that again. Well, we're to continue to study and grow more and more, and that's Paul's encouragement. He's heard that they're walking in a manner that's pleasing God, that's honoring God, but they can continue to grow. And that's an encouragement for you and I as well, uh, regardless of how long we've been a Christian, there are still areas in which we need to grow. Uh, and then in verse 2, he says, for you know what instructions we gave you 
through the Lord Jesus. Uh, and so they are aware of the instructions, of the commandments that Paul had taught them uh, through his writing, but also during the time that he was there with them. This word for instructions, some of your translations will say commandments, but these are, it's a kind of a military term of, of someone in authority giving instruction to uh, uh, like a soldier. And so this is the idea that these are instructions, these are commandments that we have from God, and it's in that place of authority that he now tells us how we ought to live or walk as believers. And so that's the instruction. Paul has been teaching it to them in person and also in writing. And so he is saying, you know what you ought to do. You've been taught it. So continue to grow in that so that you can walk in a manner that pleases God more and more. And so that's our encouragement as well. Verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. And so um, we see here that God's will for our life, our sanctification is just another way of what he just said, that we grow in our walk, uh, that we become more Christ-like, that we please God, that we honor God more and more in the way that we live through sanctification, and then he gives a specific example of how we can grow in sanctification, how we can honor God. And this example he intentionally uses because of the culture in which the recipients of this letter lived in. Uh, He moves to areas of sexual morality is the example that he gives in the area that they can grow in sanctification because Paul is giving these commands to a first century Roman culture that was marked by sexual immorality. This culture was known for uh, their promiscuity, their immorality. Um, In fact, most people in this, especially most men in this culture, it was just unknown that you had a spouse, but you also had mistresses. Prostitution was big. The, the, the norm in that culture was a, a lot of sexual immorality, and that was the, the culture that this church found themselves in. And so he was giving specific instruction to them regarding their sexual immorality for that reason, uh, because of the, the Roman culture at that time. And so uh, Paul is, is giving this instruction to them. And, um, you know, it's a reminder. God's will for us, <laughs> we always struggle. What's God's will? What's God's will? Well, we clearly know what's God's will is that we grow in sanctification, that we grow to honor and please Him more and more. And one way that we do that is uh, sexually. And so... Um, this idea of sanctification is being set apart. And you can imagine, as this church, as this church honors God sexually, how much more can they be set apart from the culture? If this is the cultural norm, which is rough uh, sexually, if that's the cultural norm, as this church, as Christians, as they honor God, as they... Uh, live by God's standards regarding sex, they are going to be set apart. That is going to be a shining example of something completely different from the norm. And this is their opportunity. And so um, they're, they're, the, the idea is here is they abstain from sexual immorality and that they live in a way different from culture. Um, the, the Greek word that is translated as sexual immorality here is porneia, and it's a very broad word. It, it's, it's referencing really any sexual relationship or anything regarding that outside of marriage covenants, outside of what's uh, explained to us in Scripture. So it's, it's a very broad word um, regarding sexual immorality. And so... Um, the beauty is that God, God instructs us and provides for us a lot of uh, 
liberty sexually within marriage. It's a gift from God. He has given that to us. But we know that, I mean, Satan's strategy from day one was to encourage sex outside of that relationship and discourage it inside of that relationship. And so Satan uh, has been very strategic from day one to destroy what God has blessed us with in regards to sexuality. And so, uh, and then he goes into more detail, verse four, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Uh, We live differently than the world when we have control over our bodies. Um, When we don't have control, it is like we have seen people when we say like, well, they're acting like animals. That means they have no control over themselves. And that is, uh, that is what God is calling us to be separate from that and have control over ourselves, that we're able to restrain impulses as we seek to honor God. Uh, animals don't restrain those impulses, but we are called to. And so, um, of course, we're to control our own body Uh, We're responsible for ourselves, and it says that we're to control our body in holiness and honor. I love uh, those two words, holiness and honor. Some of your translations may use vessel there instead of body, but uh, that's what it's meaning when it says vessel. Verse 5, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And so he says, look, You should live differently. Gentiles, they don't know God. They aren't familiar with God's standards for how we are to live. They have no concern with pleasing God in the way that they walk. They they don't care about sanctification. They don't have a relationship with God. But you do. You know God. And so you should be striving to honor Him, please Him, not just please yourselves. And so the Gentiles... No God, so who do you think they live for? They live for themselves. Whatever they want, whatever is best for them, that's what they do. We don't live like that. We honor God. So we strive to do what He wants us to do, not just what we want for ourselves. That no one, verse 6, transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. Uh, Sometimes we think about, well, they're only hurting themselves. (laughs) But we know with with sexual sin, sexual immorality, it, there's always a list of people that it hurts. Um, it, it hurts marriages. Hello? <laughs> How many marriages have we seen destroyed because of sexual immorality? It's not, you think just because you're getting away with it at the moment, uh, whether it's an affair or whatever it is, even, even um, addictions to pornography, you think that it's just an innocent sin. It's not. It destroys relationships, destroys marriages, uh, it affects children. Even if this is sexual immorality before you're married, it still affects future relationships uh, because it, you're, 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 it's something that is meant for your, your spouse, whether it's your husband or your wife, and when you take those things that are meant for that person and give it to someone else, it, it takes away from, from something that was supposed to be between you and your spouse later on. So is, this is never, this is, it, it's a transgression that, that wrongs others in the process. Sometimes we think, well, if I don't get caught, who cares? Or, or it's, only if, it's not affecting anybody else. Well, uh, Sexual immorality affects uh, a lot of people at the moment, but also down the road in the future as it robs something from marriage as well uh, down the road. So, uh, because, here he gives reasons for, uh, for this in the second part of verse 6. Because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. Um, one of the reasons that we strive for sexual purity is because that God punishes sexual immorality. God punishes sin. There are ramifications of sin. Can we find forgiveness? Yes, absolutely. Uh, regardless of what's happened in the past, 
regardless of what kind of sexual immorality that may have been part of your past, my past, anyone's past, those sins can be forgiven just like any other. Uh, but there's still ramifications, and God still takes that sin seriously, uh, and there can be punishment for those sins. And so as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you, and so we're to keep that uh, in mind, that there, there are ramifications and even punishments for these types of sins. Verse 7, for God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Again, we are called to sanctification. We are called to be set apart. We are called to live lives of holiness, not like the unholiness or the impurity of the culture. Um, we're talking about the, the Roman culture in this context, but easy application to our culture uh, as sexuality and, and what the norms of sexuality are have become completely contrary to God's Word. As we live to honor God in our lives, um, we, we are set apart. Um, I mean, what, what celebrity do you hear talk about uh, saving themselves from marriage? You don't. I mean, that's just not the norm in, in our culture. And so uh, as we live in that way, uh, we are able to be set apart. Verse 8, Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God who gives His Holy Spirit to you. Again, this is a great reminder um, because when we reject God's standard in relation to sexuality, sometimes we only think of the person we're harming. Uh, well, it, uh, I'm, I'm effect- it could be affecting your spouse. It could be affecting your future spouse. It could be affecting your kids. It could be affecting different things like that. But with regards to sexuality, we have to keep in mind, whoever disregards these things, yes, you're wronging people, absolutely. But you're also disregarding God because ultimately it's His command to us and we are dishonoring Him. Uh, We think of how we can dishonor a spouse and that's so true, we do that. But ultimately it's also a sin against God as well and we need to uh, let that be an added motivation to us to strive uh, to holiness so that we honor Him who gives His Holy Spirit to you. And so, again, we're reminded we have the power of the Holy Spirit. When we talk about temptations in in the sexual manner, which are probably the strongest temptations that that many, uh, especially some guys, face in life, we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us uh, as well, strengthening us. um, And so uh, we can't overlook that resource that we all have, the power of the Holy Spirit in us as we resist these sexual uh, temptations. And now there's a bit of a transition. He's still talking about how we are to live, but that was what we're not supposed to do. Here's some encouragement as to we are, how we are to live. And I love some of this language, because so many people pop into my mind that live this out so beautifully that I desire to emulate. Verse 9, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And so he he mentions this first uh, way that we are to live, and that is that basic commandment that we're all to live by, uh, loving one another. Um, We have been taught that. We know that. Paul's saying, you know that you should do that. Verse 10, for that indeed is what you were doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. Um, So again, they are striving to love um, throughout all Macedonia. It wasn't just those in Thessalonica that they were to love. Uh, it's not just those in your neighborhood you're to love. It's, it's all the brethren as, as they're teaching throughout Macedonia. You're doing that, but just like before, we urge you to continue to grow in that more and more. Um, and, and that's a reminder for all of us that we need to continue to grow in our love. Verse 11, and to aspire to live quietly. 
(laughs) and to mind your own business and to work with your hands as we instructed you. I love these three things. Uh, And to aspire, so we're to aspire to love one another. He says that first, and then he says to live quietly, which you think, well, that's weird. Why would (laughs) we be called to live quietly? And it's not uh, the idea that, that we have, you know, that, that we, it, it's presenting the idea that we should desire and strive to live at peace, to live in a state of satisfaction, or a word I always like to use that is missing in most people, especially my age, to live in contentment. No one has contentment. There's, there's, there's no quiet. There's no peace that God has me where he wants me. He's provided for me what I need. That sense of quiet and contentment that can come from resting in God's provision. Very few people have that. They are always striving for more. And there's never that quiet peace that we are called to have. Um, but that is what this quiet life um, is is a call to. It, it doesn't mean that you know that we don't make noise or that we keep to ourselves. Uh, that that's not what this is talking about. But it's that it, it's the opposite of what the norm is because the norm of our culture is is constant entertainment and excitement where there's no contentment. It's just striving to the next thing um, spiritually, but also culturally. Um, excitement, entertainment, that constant needing to be entertained is, is at the heart of our culture. And it's, it's never fulfilling um, because the, the, the religion and, and has a God when you live that way and it's yourself. And, and often the, the, the preachers become celebrities and how they are filling those voids of constant entertainment and that need. And, and it, that's why, I mean, we love sports. We love amusement parks. We love all of those things, but, but we can't live for those things. Um, some of you, <laughs> this was a test to live quietly. How many people lost power? Am I the only one that lost power? Me and Miss Nancy lost power <laughs> in here at the church. My, my in-laws, which are probably watching, they lost power for days. They just got it back. They were at the end of a road where trees fell over, and it was, they lost it for days. This was a test <laughs> over the weekend for a lot of these people that need constant entertainment to not have TV or phone or any of those things and not even power uh, a test to, to live quietly and the need for constant entertainment. But... Um, this is that quiet life that, that, that we have contentment in, in where God has us and who we are in him. All right. And to mind our own affairs or to mind your, your own business is ultimately what that is saying. Uh, and some translations use that exact terminology. Some of you didn't know that was a biblical idea. <laughs> we say all along, mind your own business. That's actually biblical. <laughs> uh, we don't want to take this to an extreme where we don't care about the affairs of other people. We are called to care about other people. We are called to help meet the needs of other people. We are called to pray for other people. This isn't a, we don't have anything to do with anybody else. I don't want to hear your issues. I'm minding my own business. No, we, we want to help people. We want to care for people. But this, there's a difference between our Christian duty of, of having an interest in others and uh, the compulsive itch uh, to to know everything about everybody. There is a, a difference there. There's a, a heart issue there. And we know the difference between those two things because there's a different motivation behind those two extremes. But uh, as one commentator says, Paul, however, does not mean that every individual is to mind his own business in such a way that all are to live apart from one another and have no concern for others, but simply wants to correct the idle Travality that makes men open disturbers of the peace when we ought to lead a quiet life at home. So in other words, there's a, there's a desire where you're not minding your own business, where you're 
interfering with the peace of others uh, is what we're called not to do. Not, not that we're to not have concern for others. There is a, a difference there. And then third, I, I love this. Live quietly, mind, mind your own business, and work with your hands. Uh, man, I am fearful for our culture as a whole, uh, more so in the last two years, as, as COVID has changed culture, hasn't it? I mean, COVID has had some major effects on just life. And I don't think uh, in any way more so than, than people's desire to work. It's changed. Uh, it, it changed uh, when the government started giving people even more money not to work. That made people... Uh, not work. Uh, that was one issue. Um, people not having to go into the office anymore and can work from home, I think, hurt people's work ethic. There are a lot of effects that COVID will have long term. And I think uh, a desire to work uh, and, and motivation to work is, is a big uh, uh, long term effect of COVID. But the Bible is clear. Christians should be the hardest workers at every occupation. Every factory, every workplace in Greenwood, the Christians in that workplace should be the hardest workers in each of those places. Because, yes, we work hard to make a paycheck. Yes, we work hard to provide for our family. But we have an added motivation. We work hard to honor God. Because God has called us to work hard, and so we honor Him. That is an additional motivation that you and I have as believers to work hard. It's not just for a paycheck. It's not just to move up the ladder. It's ultimately to honor God. Because remember, we started this section, it's God's will for us to grow in sanctification, to be more like Christ. And we do that by living quietly, by minding our own business, not being disturbers of the peace, and to work hard with our hands. And so that is manual labor was despite when we talk about this Greek culture, sexuality was completely different. We we mistresses and prostitution was a norm, but also manual labor was you didn't do that. If if you had any dollars <laughs> to your name, you avoided manual labor. That was just part of the Greek culture. Um, the better a man was, the less they had to work in that culture. That was how they equated the two. That once you become somebody, you never have to lift a hand. You don't have to pick things up, touch anything. You, you've arrived was that culture. And so I, I love that Paul's right here, work with your hands as we've instructed you to do. I, I love the fact that Jesus came. What was his occupation? A carpenter. He worked hard with his hands. He probably had calluses on all of his fingers. He worked uh, with his hands in that physical way. And so very contrary to society. Of course, all those early apostles, they were all fishermen. Uh, tent makers were those early missionaries with Paul. I mean, they, were all, they all worked with their hands, and I, and I love that. And so we can honor God in that way so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. And so, uh, in other words, there is an evangelistic component to all of this. We live in this way following God's standards regarding sexuality. We live in this way regarding uh, not rallying people up, but living at peace with others and working hard so that we can walk in a way that outsiders see a difference in us. There is an evangelistic component to us living in a way that, yes, we honor God, that's the ultimate motivation, but also so that outsiders, those that don't have a relationship with God, can see a difference in our lives. And so uh, I love these, these verses. Um, so now you can tell people, mind your own business, it's biblical. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. Um, Feel free to use that one. All right. Uh, let's pray together. Next week, we'll start in verse 13 and tackle what it means to fall asleep at time uh, after we die before Christ's return that may have some questions in your mind. We will talk about that uh, next week. All right, let's pray. 
Father, we, we thank you for this word, this very practical reminder. Father, may we live this out in our culture today in a way that people see a difference in our lives as we, as we love others, as we strive to live at peace with others and not uh, rile up dissension, but Father, seek peace. And as we uh, live in contentment and as we work hard, Father, as we honor you in these ways, may people see the difference in our lives and be drawn to a saving relationship with you. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.